Kagami, colon, Japan. Comma, Japan. Yo! Yeah, comma, like like Chicago, it. comma, Illinois. Did we not? Oh, yeah. we discussed this. <laughs> Buraku and the writing of ethnicity about fiction writer Kenji Nakagami, uh, literature experts in the crowd, of which I know one or two are here, recognize Kenji Nakagami. Uh, Mr. Nakagami was Japan's first big name author, identifying as Hisabetsu Buraku, uh, a Buraku, a person of Buraku descent of that class who is discriminated, discriminated against, ergo Hisabetsu. Uh, you can find that book wherever people sell good literature. Uh, what else have I got for you? If you're interested, she's also the author of a prize-winning article, Wages of Affluence, The High-Rise Housewife in Japanese Sex Films. There's the twist. <laughs> Title speaks for itself. If you're interested, go check it out. Uh, but tonight, we turn away from dusty pages to the silver screen. Uh, Anne will bring us a few minutes on the technical and creative minds behind science films, the Kagaku Ega, and, uh, and how they are formed, and the myriad applications and such. Without further ado, Anne McKnight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. All right. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for having me working at a yeah, a this person in a fairly oriented series. As the introducer mentioned, I am by training, and everyone. We absolutely test these things. Yeah, nothing like trial. It's, it's an experimental presentation about experimental films, so <laughs> what better way to start than with um, a technical experiment. Anyway, as um, I'm a literary historian, and all of you know what literature is, and does, and what we largely, mostly do is deal, what I do is deal with figural language, and which is how the language that we use to describe things puts us in relationships um, as a kind of interface language itself with the objects and the kind of processes of the social world. And um, in this, this presentation, I changed it a little bit, the title in, in homage to James's presentation to uh, allude to the BL as butterfly love here. Because <laughs> I think the butterflies here too in their summer finery, Natsugata. Um, you can see already there's kinds of social inscriptions in the science. There's a boy butterfly and there's a girl butterfly. And they're equally distributed on the page, right? And the kind of symmetrical composition kind of places, gives us equal access and equal, puts, puts both of them in a kind of equal field of visibility. And I changed it to the butterflies and smog because people who used, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of the milestones of how people used the interfaces of lenses and um, Kenbi Kyoega, the kind of microscopic movies or, and um, different ways of using kind of optical technologies to put people in different relationships with science. And the kind of general tendency is that before the war, um, people were really super obsessed because of popular science booms with ways that you could tinker and um, use, do th even things at home, use microscopes, use lenses, slow things up, um, speed them, slow things down, <laughs> speed them up, <laughs> and really manipulate the viewer's relationship to an object so that visible worlds, be worlds became visible that you couldn't actually see with the naked eye. And so the phrase invisible world, mienai sakai, comes up over and over again in both English and Japanese language kind of writings. And so butterflies deal with, they deal with movement and the camera can capture different kinds of movement that a still photograph really can't deal with very well. Um, movement over time. So you can see things like change, you can see things like movement, you can see objects in space. And so the smog is, is the kind of just an allusion to some later post-war films. Rather than showing you the objects, what they wanna do is put you as a new democratic citizen after the war and in a kind of new relationship with knowledge so that you can pick up knowledge that has been kind of generated by experts and scientists who kind of coordinate this knowledge. But you, if you're a seven-year-old kid in Kawasaki and your school is having a problem with flies, you can pick this knowledge up, organize your classmates, and clean up the town, basically. So anybody can become a, 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 a scientifically oriented citizen even without be being an expert, him or herself. Okay, so smog gets you actual environmental kind of pollution and issues in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay, so there's science films, it's a, ba it's a baggy category. <laughs> All right, and let me explain a couple of the, the I don't know what, what metaphor, how bag, 
works as a metaphor, the, the handles on the back. <laughs> um, some of you who are from cultural studies may know this guy, Walter Benjamin. And he was a kind of, kind of a, he was many things, but among them was a media philosopher. And he was really interested in how new media forums could generate new kinds of democratic viewing. And he wrote a book in German about a, a book of plant photography by um, a friend of his, Carl Blosfeld, I believe the guy's name was. And he, this is one of the kind of my mind has been blown type of quotes in which he uh, explains this idea that he comes up with called the optical unconscious, um, whether we accelerate the growth. So he's talking about the different kinds of things that um, film te cinema technology can do. Okay, using time-lapse photography, enlarging things, and this kind of, this word that geyser as a collapse of kind of nature and culture, something that makes you so vividly aware of the stuff that's on the screen that it um, makes you stop being aware that it's being mediated for you. It's the kind of um, experience that he really treasures. Okay, this is up again in places where we would least have thought them possible. So it, again, it kind of makes you alert to things in the world that you normally wouldn't be alert to. So, and the, for him, the optical unconscious also brings up as our own unconscious does, kinds of relationships that are hidden and that only become visible once you view them through this kind of estranging media interface. So let me show you a couple of these things. Oops, that way. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's see, that one, there we go. Okay, so this is, um, so what kind of objects do people look at? This is a post, post, oops, post-war slide. Um, and this is for experts, this is for doctors, There's, um, it's for the, to, to educate doctors but also the general public about the really nasty things that can happen to you, uh, the public health disease of tuberculosis. They actually perform surgery and it lets you see in really intimate detail the incredible kind of, um, the way that tuberculosis pro progresses as a disease and then the kind of surgery that's required to take care of it. So the invisible, the world that it opens up is the insides of the human body and how tuberculosis works at a kind of microscopic level and also the world that we, the social world we typically don't have access to which is how surgery works and how, how tuberculosis then can be um, remedied. Uh, not quite yet. Yeah. And just to locate the, the in, in the Japanese context, since I'm switching over to the Japanese kinds of cultural forms, there's a long history, people who study biology probably know a long history of, um, of sketching that began in Edo period with sketching out these incredibly elaborate um, designs of plants for re reference as um, medical materials. And there's also a long tradition of sketching. Um, this is a kind, kind of, oops. Now what did I do? Or was that <laughs> was that even me? <laughs> oh boy. Well, Maso Kashiki, um, he links to the previous slide because he actually he was the sort of the modern inventor of haiku, and he himself had tuberculosis, and so he wrote many of his best haiku lying in bed eating persimmons and other fruits. And so this is a tradition of sketching in which he tried to develop a language to put you in relationship with the world. Um, in the kind of high, uh, the, the natural world um, through sketching, verbal kinds of sketching. Okay, science films, as I said, were, it's a very un, uh, kind of unruly genre. Um, the word kagakuega encompasses all kinds of industrial films, government sponsored films, local municipality sponsored films, corporate sponsored films, um, lots of honky tonk DIY films, and amateur medical films. There's entire magazines uh, for amateur film production that have long series about how to take microscope movies. So where did this all come from? It became kind of retrofitted to, to incorporate all of these unruly elements of the genre, including educational films. Okay, and this is one of the real outliers. <laughs> <laughs> the science film, you probably may recognize the name D.W. Griffith, he's the man who brought you Birth of a Nation, okay? And he, this is a film about a cave, uh, um, triumphalist film about the victories of, of, a, of a caveman and it's, it's sometimes classified as a scientific film because it's about evolution, okay? So in this particular imagination of evolution, this can be included. So I'm, what I'm saying is not, not, not everyone is a rigorous theorist of science films, okay? But however, um, due to the boom in Taisho period and the early part of the Showa period, this is a magazine that's still going, Kodomo no Kagoku. 
um, there was a huge boom and uh, magazines like Karomo no Kagaku, Kagaku Chishiki, Shin Seinen, all of these had this kind of operational aesthetic. They wanted to show people and even um, show people how to do some of the science and parascientific things, lots of experimental things happening. And for children, in this case. Okay. Um, the way that the term uh, kagakuega has a complicated route into Japan through German film, German documentary films called um, culture films, which were translated in a very famous book called Documentary Film by Paul Rotha. Um, the Japanese translation was as a bunka ega or cultural film. If that's not complicated enough, <laughs> cultural film <laughs> becomes science film. Um, it's the, the culture films are predominantly, to make a long story short, they're predominantly documentaries. And so things that could be about their non-dramatic, um, I'm sorry, they're, they're non-fiction films that are non-dramatic and depict uh, things like military battles. They're not newsreels, that's the other thing. They're kind of, um, they tell narrative stories, but they're not about newsreels. And newsreels really took off in 1937 after um, the kind of really de decisive um, outbreak of hostilities between Japan and China. So people started going to the movie theater to see nonfiction films a lot more. And these culture films, these bunka ega, were then required by the Ministry of Education. Well, you could get certified by Ministry of Education and movie theaters were requ required to show these nonfiction films in the theaters. Kind of, that's a very kind of short history of how this kind of classifier genre of the bunka ega got into um, to Japan. This is the most popular German version. Any of you who have seen Lenny Riefenstahl's Olympia or have seen um, Ichikawa Kon's book, uh, excuse me, movie about the Olymp called Tokyo Olympiad would recognize this kind of Grecian pageantry. Um, this is obviously a fictional, it's complete mythic representation of reality. It doesn't pretend to be nonfiction, but I just put that, th I, I gave this example because it's the most popular and therefore you might have heard of it. Okay, but one of the things interesting about these kinds of media archaeologies is that archaeology, you dig a lot of things up. And I'm really kind of interested in the monograph form. In literary studies, we typically view the monograph, which means a, a story about a single person, as being kind of unrigorous and therefore sort of a dowdy form. So I really like looking at old memoirs to dig up how people kind of relate with the kinds of, we're all kind of held together with, you know, various elements of glue and mud and sticks, right? <laughs> and, and you can look and see how the glue and mud and sticks really allies different social, puts people emphasize the different social forces in their lives and using very different language. This is Harada Mitsu. He's one of the editors of, um, this is his memoir. And people describe themselves really differently. They describe their relationships with their professions very differently. And kakakuega are really interesting because they come through not only through distribution um, and the studios when to Toa, or when the distributors picked up um, the German films and then started making the Japanese version of, of Bunka Ega, but they, there are people like um, mus uh, sellers of musical instruments and record players in the Ginza. And they started themselves to have a much more DIY kind of attitude towards making movies. And Harada Mitsuo was one of these people. He started um, making kind of experimental kits. He made lots of incredibly intricate models. So if you've seen a a a NHK's Asadora, and you see these amazing intricate models. He was an early pioneer of that kind of model making. Just incredibly interesting ways of thinking about the interface through which like every person can have a relationship with the scientific world. So science is not just an object. It's not just a fact. It's a set of relationships that you can get at um, through various kinds of interfaces. And in his own montage, uh, his biography, he puts his late wife. This is the photograph of his, you know, his, his, one of his babies that started right after the 1923 earthquake. And also some of his kind of demi friends from the demi monde. And these are kind of just the way that people tell their stories about their professional lives, its coexistence with the demi monde in ways that we typically don't talk about today, even in the kind of gay no kai. I find really interesting the different kinds of um, lack of professionalism in a really kind of um, generative way. Okay. Hmm? Andrew. <laughs> Sorry, it's again. No, it's not. Say my name, but then you make that <laughs> No, but it's <laughs> Try it now. There we go. Okay, and so here, are, here we go. <laughs> All right.
friends. I brought some of. I brought some of the books to show if people are interested. Um, I don't know if the, there may be physicists here who know Knock Through the Sky, Knock Out. Oh. Um, Nakaya Ukichiro, like his daughter is also an artist, she, Fumiko, she has a, she's an atmospheric artist, she works a lot with clouds, and he's the one who, um, he created, a, had a laboratory in Hokkaido, and it was he who literally is the person who created the atmospheric conditions for viewing snowflakes, so that we could actually tell um, that snowflakes, each and every single one of them is different, and he did these amazing taxonomies or of snowflakes, but also just kinds of examples of snowflakes, because if it's, if they're genuinely unique, their taxonomy is going to be a kind of infinite task. Anyway, he's really important in, um, partly because of his establishing this kind of atmospheric lab, but he also was an early um, kind of founder of Iwanami Shoten, which is, uh, or Iwanami Production, um, which is a very important documentary movie company that a lot of people that had sort of relationships with Iwanami Shoten, but also went independent and just kind of generated a lot of independent filmmakers that you might have heard of, and I'm now blanking on some of them, but basically every kind of Nouvelle Vague person from the 60s or 70s you might have heard of had kind of some con point of contact with Iwanami. So he took the laboratory idea out of the university and the field and, and thought of kind of creating cinema and as a laboratory and, and basically started the whole, launched the whole genre of the popular sponsored science movie. So let me show you, uh, I'll just really quickly, these are, this is um, the kind of folk, much more folk, folkloric understanding of what a science movie is. It involves going to the hinterlands and kind of a lot of observing and showing how the camera, it's very recursive, it shows how the camera um, men, yeah at that time, cameramen kind of composed their shots and how they made a movie actually. So it's a little bit like a Nanook of the North in the sense, except that it um, doesn't have fictional elements in it. Okay, so let me show you a minute or two of, a, um, of, a, of an Iwanami film so you get a sense of what a Kagakuega looks like in the post-war era. This is con uh, this convex lens, Totsurenzu. show in that film um, is the kind of participatory aesthetic that the, the narrator develops, like, like, let's give it a shot, right? So it's trying to create a relationship um, between the person watching and uh, the, the film itself. And the way that it kind of creates, it has this kind of really playful, goofy aesthetic. It's not only trying to break down the laws of optics, in, it does some of that later, but it's trying to place you in a kind of playful and speculative and unpredictable kind of accidental relationship with the world. And accident is one of the things that in his critical writings, theoretical writings, that Nakaya really emphasize, emphasizes the importance of. He says all scientific scholarship either boils down to keisatsu chogata, like following the criminal, you know where it is, and recreating the clues, or amazon gata, meaning it's the great unknown and you don't know where the hell you're going. Right, so he's a really he's a big fan of kind of accident and experiment and kind of re-enchanting the world, showing how the world that we take as every day actually has these kind of magical properties that we can understand um, through laws of physics, right? Let me just show you really quickly a couple more. Oh, this is a really nasty one. Um, in the public health and hygiene, like for the urban dweller were really important things after the war. A lot of people were really sick. Typhus was a really nasty disease. 
right? And other fly-borne diseases were like super nasty. Okay, so I want to show you, and um, so getting people, yeah, we'll see. All right, uh, that's the other one, that's searching for oil. <laughs> so this is the more corporate kind of sector of the Kagakuega, sort of technology and sort of uh, high-speed economic growth, science in the spirit of, oh, hi, that's it. And roughly around six, you could go, like, go to five, like six minutes in. So you can see all the, yeah, these are the, the nasty things that flies carry around with them and it has this really great spatial imaginary that it starts with the rice bowl and the table and all the nasty things that can happen and then it gradually expands to your dinner table and sort of has this conceptual expansion thing that so if you think actors are difficult, you should try working with um, insects. <laughs> and there are some great stories. Uh, I wrote some books to pass around. Another book is... Some of the books to pass around are called the book of the book. So now you're like, you can imagine the, you know, the flies moving from the rice bowl to your windows, to your ceiling, to kind of infin infinitely expanding the fly world. Um, and that movie was directed by Nakamura Rinko, and she's one of the early, fam kind of the, one of the first regularly employed female directors. And she worked, um, she worked. For, she, had, she had a number. She she was in charge of a number of insect films and also a lot of domestic films, like How to Iron, which is pretty. The, the, so the invention of domestic science as a thing that can be broken down, um, and that one also has to learn the techniques of, um, is a, is a, sorry, another topic. Rapidly coming to an end here. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. But another really important part of the science is kind of. Um, scaling up from the dinner table to d overseas development projects. And this is a film that plays it kind of one of these sweeping wiki-ish films that starts with the dawn of time and fire and ends up um, in a factory or with an automobile, right? And it's about kind of writing Japan into global capital, right? The beauties of global capital, the connections of local capital, all the oil from Mexico and Venezuela that um, also, and they're like, that, and then are shooting certain scenes in Akita and parts of northern Japan, which, unbeknownst to me, also have kind of oil fields. All right. So this is um, basically just a sketch of how invisible worlds, the optical unconscious, were brought to people before the war from through the you know through technologies such as lenses and new kinds of film forms, right? Um, the silent film, microscopic film. And then how after the war, a kind of participatory aesthetic is created to, to, to get people to feel like they're part of the scientific world and expertise is not something that's just out there, right? It's something that they themselves can become a part of the, um, a part of and who's, even if they don't know the language, the technical language, they can pick it up in practice and use it to help their communities. So I did uh, kind of a bibliography, kind of quick and dirty, but it has some interesting stuff in it in Japanese and English. If you're interested in reading about um, medical films <laughs> or <laughs> science films or any of these kind of really crazy media archaeology biographies, um, you can check online in the Dropbox site and take a look at it. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Who's got a question for Anne? Uh, we have some rules first. <laughs> this is question and answer, not dissertation and counter dissertation. Okay, that goes to the speaker too. His support's up here. That's the rule. Okay, everyone Who's got questions. <laughs> okay. So, can you talk about sex and gender? Just because kind of preview, just because there must be some cool stuff with sex and gender in science films. Yeah. Um. Where would I start? <laughs> well, one thing that's inter I mean, it's really interesting, starting the butterfly, but with, with the butterfly example, it's like how very few humans are in these movies, 
actually. Um, there's often a human voice. It can be a female voice sometimes, as I think, I think I sh yeah, in the convex link, Totsurens, there was a female narrator. I find that expertise is often coded um, masculine. You know, when it's a domestic scene, it's coded feminine. If you want the person who made the How to Iron movie, you know, as scientific as it is, you know, it's, it's a woman who produced it, and I believe it's a woman who narrated it. So there's never any kind of masculine presence in, in the domestic realm. Um, in terms of the production, overwhelmingly male production force, there was another woman, Okano Kauruko, who was really active in Iwanami and around kind of the Ginza world of making science movies. Uh, as Science movies also have a huge crossover with educational films, so people in the distributor and then in the kind of implementation end of things in the classroom may very well have been female. I'm going to look at some archives in the National Film Center, or F Film Archive, I think they call it now, and, and read some of Okano's kind of memoirs and her big boxes of stuff, and I'll have more of an idea what role women played in these inter interstitial kinds of places, if, even if they weren't bankrolling, bankrolling or hanging out with uh, Shibusawa Eiichi or, you know, like a lot of the big players, the male players who funded the stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, thank you for talking today. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So what were the main intentions of making these um, kagakuega or science movies, like you said? Because um, these science movie really reminds me of like modern mm -hmm. abstract art, where like people just take Absolutely. materials and they don't really put any meaning or intention to the art. It's more like, look at this, there's no definition to it, that's so cool. And in the science um, movie, I, I mean, Kagakuega, it's more mm. like, because the science, I guess, the access to science has come so much closer to the public after the industrialization, as mm. you mentioned. So people have started to obtain those science and brought them into movies. So my question is, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it like a trend because the science thing suddenly came so close and people were like, oh my god, I need to bring this into my movie? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, maybe in the first part of it, you were kind of picking up on the sort of surrealist impulse, which is to link, ob you know, link objects which are typically not related but are only done so through the unconscious. Like the convex lens movie reminded me a lot of Ver like Ver you know, Ziga Bertov's um, Man with a Movie Camera. It's a, an amazing movie. He's a Soviet sort of cons constructivist director, and it's about all the things that you can do if you're just running around the city with a movie, movie camera on a truck. <laughs> and I mean, that's a kind of reductive explanation, but it's like delight and glee and the properties of what a movie camera can bring you in terms of bringing the world to you. So there, it's not really narrative. It's more kind of spectacular, like what kinds of new access to new sites can people have and then Bertov's particular aesthetic was to um, kind of tie this to the rhythm of a city. So he saw these new kinds of sites within the rhythm of the city. And some directors did that with like the rhythms of organisms. And they wanted to, there were some aesthetic tendencies in some of the filmmakers. There's some really gorgeous films about petroleum, for instance, <laughs> when people kind of dematerialized these, um, these things from their status as commodities or from their status as objects in a commodity system and they kind of looked at the physical or acoustic or kind of material properties of them. So they look, they became medium media of a sort. So there's lots of ways that like bodies become media or natural objects become media. And so in certain of the filmmakers, the division between nature and, cult nature and culture or subject and object just kind of really disappears. Um, but on the other hand, some of those films are, are, are sponsored by petroleum companies, you know. <laughs> so um, that kind of aesthetic can be sort of undercut by, like, its, its role in um, underwriting certain kinds of capitalism. But the, um, so yeah, access to new worlds, some of which are aesthetic. And they, yeah, many, just many different kinds of aims. I think some people were very instrumental. Like, they want, they want knowledge. They definitely want tuberculosis to go away. And they want to show people how disgusting it is and how people suffer like under tuberculosis, so there's, um, yeah, many rooms in that mansion, <laughs> yeah. That was super fun. Um, I just wanted to ask very briefly about connections between this and science fiction, and you mentioned sort of narratives in the, in the films and stuff, right. but what about the back and forth between, between those, both in film and literature? 
Yeah, that's interesting because I, I first started looking at these films because I was really irritated at the lack of popular narratives attached to environmental causes. We have UN reports coming out. We have, at the same time, as global consumption of fossil fuels and carbon is going up. Like, even despite the fact there's a major disconnect between what we know and what we actually do. So I wanted to look back at the era where public intellectuals, or scientists were public intellectuals, they wrote things and they made things and they had a kind of, they tried to deliver their scientific results to the world and get peop and people listened to them. In, um, they weren't afraid of talking to kids, you know, they weren't afraid of being vulgar and honky-tonk. And so I wanted to, as a, a kind of media archaeology, to dig up some of these prior kinds of precedents and relationships and say, how did people talk about you know, I, nature, culture, it's a reified boundary and it doesn't really exist, but at the same time, in the Anthropocene, you know, we do have an effect on things like butterflies and smog. Um, so that was one thing. I've, I've, and, the, and speculative fiction is another, and science fiction, yeah, or obviously places where these kinds of um, alternate, where possible worlds, alternate worlds, speculative understandings of technology could occur. Um, maybe the kinds of speculation in a lot of science fiction are much more imaginary, but they work through similar issues. You know, what happens when um, interfaces change? How does that put you in a different relationship with the world when you're Barbarella and you're, you know, you change your language by changing your watch? It really changes that relationship with the world. Um, so I think People don't bring those, some of the magazines had a lot of sci-fi stuff. Uno Juza is writing around this time, other early sci-fi, I'm sorry, in Taisho and early Showa. Um, so there's a shared imaginary in popular culture when in these earlier stuff that I'm looking at. After the war, when expertise becomes more of a kind of, um, people are more self-conscious about expertise and science and it's really scaling up, there's less attempt in the popular press, I, I'm, I don't, I have, I have to do more reading around to see what the connections are between kind of fiction writers and documentary people. But I don't see these people making, making fictional attempts at speculation, but they're really thinking about post-war democracy, recursive self, you know, citizens and self-determination. Those kinds of fictions are really definitely on a lot of, and environmental issues like pesticides, really on people's minds. Okay. We have time for one more quick question. Do, Ten words do, or less. Do and one we? Because we're, we're kind of tight. words or less. Don. Yes. Only if it's that fast, though. Only. I'm, hitting, I'm, getting, I'm getting itchy over here. <laughs> not, not capable of doing it. Also, Henry, this talk is later. <laughs> Are still like popular, or is it like having? less and less popular nowadays because I, it yeah. seems like everything is shifted to science fiction. No, I mean, a lot of, some of his films were made for specialized. There were sci Kagakue got science film festivals all over the world, uh, connecting people in Japan to people in the Eastern Bloc. So I don't know the professional context right now, but I'm gonna bet that there are a lot of professional films that are being made for, for people, uh, dealing with medical imagery and so forth. So I think science films, the film part may not be so literal, but, um, I don't, you know, I, I'm really, I have to think about it, because I, I, when I go to the movies, I really sense a um, kind of... <laughs> okay, we can talk later. <laughs> but medical, yeah, Excuse medical me. imaging, um, imaging data. We're gonna wait for this to come out. Um, Anne will be around during, uh, during the breaks, uh, but she's not forced to talk to you, so if she doesn't like you, she probably won't. Um, <laughs> So if you have a continuation or further questions, please come up and see Anne. She'll maybe be available, maybe, maybe yeah, not. We'll see. And Anne McKnight, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You. I have never double-fisted microphones. Um, it is 9.50, right now, PM, and we are gonna get back right here at 10, oh, wait, no, is it nine? It's 8 or 50. I can't read an analog watch, even though it's digital smartwatch. We'll see you at 5 after the hour. That's the easy way to do it, Melvin, damn it. Um, if you have been downloading lots of porn over the internet, our stream is a little slow. Please stop doing that. We'll see you at 5 after, damn it, Kai. See y'all soon. Thank you.
court.
Is that better? Kind of. Where is this? Uh, yeah, it's me. Must be me. Yeah, it must be me. Hi guys. Okay, fine. How's this? It's good. Perfect. Every last one of you got this wrong last time. Peace and long life. Come on, give me the call back. Come on. Live long and prosper. Come on. It's peace and long life. Live long and prosper. Regulars, learn it. Teach the new folks every time. One more time. Peace and long life. Shut up and prosper. Good, that means shut up. Thank you. Uh, that's, is this my phone? This is my phone, thanks. Um, I left this on the sofa, lost and found, taken care of. Good job, Andrew. Uh, are you all sufficiently settled? Are you ready for our next talk? Are you ready for our superb second speaker? Henry, he's holding, he's got the wireless mic. Is that working? Should he be holding the regular one? It seems God, we're going to find out, aren't we? We're going to figure this out. Yeah. If it doesn't work, you have a wired mic. Well, you did, and now it's gone. Good. I'm very happy about that. Uh, so, we have things we want to talk to you about. Uh, next talker, Subasa, is coming up in just a moment. But for now, we have other things we want to talk about very, very briefly. Firstly, we want to give a big, big thanks, next thank you, um, to our venue here, Nagata Joe Grid, brought to you by company Gaiax. They're pretty awesome. Uh, are we... I'll happily talk over the video if you'll play it, and Henry will turn it down slightly. So we're going to stand here. Um, that's Grid. That's where you are. This is daytime, though. No. Um, Gaiax operates Nagata Cho Grid. This is a startup studio. They re they're focused in a little lower, Henry. A little lower. This is too sensual for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like bring it lower, seriously. Oh, we're done, did it? Did somebody do it? Cool, thank you. Um, their mission is to resolve social problems in community and using the community and sharing economy. Nerd Knight, in its meager contribution to society, uh, is here thanks to them. We would like to thank Gaiax for that. Uh, we are welcome here, so are you. Several spaces here are free of charge, several co-working spaces upstairs. Um, they have offices for rental available here as well. The only requirement for a lot of this is to sign up as part of the Gaiax community. Uh, you can find postcards there at the bar. I may have hit a few of them, but they're there, they're there in front of the thing. We have Henry, awesome intern, not intern, now, he, now he's a full-fledged person now, um, gesturing wildly toward probably where the cards are. Uh, lots of events, yoga nights, movie nights, seminars, awesome things, including Nerd Night. We're awesome, thanks, we know. Uh, <laughs> it's a great place to work, network, and connect. Come hang out here. If you ever do any work near Nagaracho, near Akasaka Mitsuke, very central, as you know, because you're here. And if you're not here, you're probably not in Tokyo anyway. So it doesn't matter. Grab a postcard at the bar and get signed up. Uh, and we could talk about Space Cafe, uh, if that video is... Is that good time? Yes, good timing. Thank you, video timing. Our dear friends at Space Cafe, anybody here tonight? Anybody from Space Cafe here tonight? No? Astrophysics? Um, they talk about space. Uh, they have a speaker come out every month uh, on a Tuesday, normally. The next show is very soon, December 18th at 8 p.m. at Good Heavens Bar, Grill, and Emporium uh, in Shimokitazawa. It's pretty great. Uh, we used to have a venue there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yes, and uh, next is... Uh, my thing, if you are a gaming nerd, raise your hand. Video games, board games, whatever, if you enjoy these things. Not nearly enough of you. Um, we are, yes, see, famously, famously board game addict Don Warren, friends. Uh, we have a monthly gaming group happening. We have it mostly, more or less, on Sunday, Monday evenings every month. 
Uh, we do lots of cool things like play console games and play PC games and do stuff and fun things and board games occasionally. We're working on that at the moment, Don. So come hang out with us. Our next event actually is on Monday evening in Asagaya. So if you are around Monday evening, please feel free to join us. Uh, and if you have any questions about it, or if you want to join the group on Facebook, look up Tokyo Casual Gaming Encounters. Yes, I made that name up, and yes, it's a Craigslist joke. Um, it is. So as you know on Facebook, if you're not really a follower of the Church of Zuck, please email me at jm at john-matthews.net. It's an H in the J, an H in the John, and two T's in the Matthews. Next up, please. Now, if you are clicking, thank you. Uh, if you like money and you are on a project, there's, there's, there's a catch. There's a catch. If you like money and achieving things, if you are working on a project, a research thing that could possibly turn into a nerd night talk, that's kind of the catch. Surprise, surprise. Uh, please come talk to us. Well, talk to Amanda. She's far better at judging these things than, than, uh, than any of the rest of us, quite frankly. Uh, come back, come, come and say hello to us. Our first grant award is for a study of medicinal plants coming to us in 2019 uh, in front of you, the audience, assuming you're still here. We hope you're still here. Please come back. I believe we're ready. Are we ready? We're ready. Talk about Subasa, Subasa Kondo. He is a survivalist, an emergency medicine enthusiast, an ultra trail marathoner. What's your longest? What's your longest trail marathon? Fifty. Fifty kilometers, I assume. <laughs> uh, I am American. It could be like meters, or it could be something else. I don't know. Uh, a full stack and fully crazy software dev. Full stack. I admit, I am very jealous of being. That is. That is some talent. Uh, his talk tonight will explore the socioeconomic issues stemming from centralized web services. And as you might have guessed, it's about decentralization and distribution and how we can address the issues of centralization. Subasa, are you ready to go? Should I vamp for like a minute? Are you good? I think I'm good. You think you're good? All right. Yes. There's a spare mic over there in case yours cuts out. Don't make me come up here. Subasa Kondo, everybody. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, guys. I'm, oh, that's, yeah, not stable. Anyways, um, I'm a software engineer uh, at a small startup in Shibuya called Git. Um, but engineering is not just my trade. It's also my passion. Um, I love making stuff. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there's this one mobile app I've made recently, my team, called uh, uh, Zenny. What it does is uh, it allows civilians who are in uh, disaster context um, self-organize disaster response. So you can share time location information regarding you know, uh, where the hazard areas are, where the aid tents are, where the water is sourced, um, so that they can um, themselves uh, at the disaster situation. I'm sorry, this is, this is like a mating call uh, among developers where we, we name drop these technologies and then after the talk, they kind of you know, flock to you. Um, so if you're not a developer, just like, kind of me? Can we trade yeah, let's do this. <laughs> we tested it again. Yeah, uh, let me just name drop these things. Um, so this app uses React Native and Firebase. Um, I also made another app recently called BroAmp. This one uses uh, Vue, Vuex, uh, IPFS, and OrbitDB. This is a decentralized app, so I'll go into this uh, more in detail later. Um, this is our shared house's uh, kitchen utensil drawer. Um, I made this using plywood, uh, particle uh, board, and uh, Semidine C. Uh, I, I call this particular uh, project, I'm a tray. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I love making things. Um, I also uh, love a good adventure. Um, I love running. I love running so much that uh, I ran up Mount Fuji from the sea. That's a total of 50K. Um, I also love disappearing into the woods and uh, starting my own fire, building a shelter, and just like spending the night. Okay, so let's do this adventure. Um, today's adventure is distributed apps. Um, and first, I'd like to bring the, to the table the, the problem. Uh, the way I see it. The problem is that the internet is broken, and I hope I can affect to you the, the scale of the issue. 
And then from there, I'd like to um, present a couple of alternatives, specifically uh, you know, decentralization and distribution. And specifically, I'd like to go into IPFS uh, in detail. Okay, so uh, what is wrong with the modern web? Uh, so let me first define what I mean by the modern web. Um, so there's these loosely associated set of protocols called the internet protocols. Um, I think you guys are familiar with this, like things like HTTP, HTTPS, uh, TCP IP, and uh, for the email of aficionados, POP3, SMTP, IMAP, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I mean, these protocols have, you know, we've piggybacked on this and, you know, we've had a great two decades of the world ch being changed by the internet, right? And so th this is wonderful, but um, we're increasingly facing issues, uh, and they're threefold. One is uh, an efficiency issue. Another is a resilience issue. And a more nuanced problem is uh, the ownership issue. So let's first talk about efficiency. Um, who here knows what latency is? Um, here, a uh, gentleman with uh, the red slash. Yeah, it, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, you know, when you're uh, uh, on your browser and try to get uh, some sort of data from the, the server, it's, it's that time it takes to, to make that, uh, that uh, transmission. And essentially with your usual URL, you have, you know, google.com, et cetera, and then that is resolved into an IP address. An IP address means it's a, it's a expression of a geographic location. So this might be, um, you know, some server in Shanghai, for example. Um, and you can see that, you know, they're, they're in most of the developed areas uh, of the, the global, but they're not everywhere, right? Um, and the problem that, that arises is, let's say, you know, I want a cat picture. I want a cat picture. Um, and originally, it was in Germany. It was a server in Germany. Um, but everybody else has this cat picture. It was pretty popular. But the way HTTP and the internet works today is you have to get that cat picture all the way from that server in Germany um, to, to get that particular URL. Even if you know, uh, somebody in this room right now had that same picture on their device right now, I'd still have to go around the world to get that picture. And this problem is compounded when you use something like Google Docs. Right? Um, it's, it's not rare where you know, you're in a classroom situation and you're working collaboratively on the same document. And instead of your browser communicating directly with uh, your peers, um, you actually have to communicate all the way to the server. A bigger issue is bandwidth. So let's go back to that classroom situation again. And let's say I want to watch, you know, I, I want to watch the Gandam video. You know, I got to get the Gandam. Then it's, it's just a 200 megabyte video. That's, you know, if I'm the only one watching it. Uh, and so that's 200 megabytes of bandwidth that I eat up. But let's say there's a new Gandam video, and then everybody wants to watch it. Um, then just that 200 megabyte video, even you know, if you guys are in the same block, the same city, you're going out to this server to get all that information, right? And so you do the simple multiplication, and that's 48 gigabytes of data being spent. This is grossly inefficient. So efficiency is a problem. Uh, resiliency, bigger problem, I see. <clears throat> so Google Docs. Um, let's say Google Docs goes down. Then, this is ironic, right? Um, just a couple of years ago, you, it wouldn't be a problem if you didn't have the internet while you're editing your document. But now, it's all gone to shit. Like, oh, I can't, I can't even type a single word. It's, it's frustrating. But it's so convenient that we've been you know, put into this situation. And this isn't just the case of Google Documents. It's the, the case with most of the things that we do in our everyday lives. Things like uh, you know, Gmail, uh, Wikipedia, uh, storing data. You know, you, we used to have big hard drives, but now we have all of them in Dropbox or Google Drive. And um, essentially, when you have these bigger platforms are, are you know, uh, unavailable, then it really stops business. You know, if you're Kanye, then... <laughs> You, you can't troll the internet anymore. It's, this is a significant issue for, for Kanye. Um, but, but seriously, there's, there's also all these other you know, um, scenarios where the way that the internet works right now, you can't have access. Um, let's say you're traveling or you know, your ISP has an outage, which isn't rare in the US. 
um, you know, or there could just be some sort of you know uh, physical disaster, and the data center and the data is physically lost. There's also a, a human infrastructure problem. Um, Turkey, um, Turkey, uh, you, you know, they, they're not the most democratic government. Um, they they recently, uh, this is just a recent example. They um, made a, a Wikipedia-wide blockade, so the entirety of Wikipedia could not be uh, viewed uh, in Turkey. And this is possible because there's one single URL, there's one single IP address that they could just say, this is off the list of things that uh, our routers will serve. Okay, there's another issue, ownership. So um, who owns the internet, right? It's a very, uh, interesting question, and I'm gonna answer it by picking up some words from uh, Scott Kelly. I, I heard a couple of laughs, so I guess there's some folks who are familiar. It's uh, a, a professor at uh, NYU uh, for marketing, and essentially he talks about companies and influence. And you know, in 2006, the, these companies, uh, not surprising, GE, ExxonMobil, um, Citibank, these were the five largest companies in the world. And now the five largest companies are actually all tech companies. And these are called, I believe, the, the four henchmen. And it's ironic how you know Facebook um, has 2.4 billion users, and in comparison to that, you know the, the Catholic Church has one billion users. <laughs> so it's it's like the Catholic Church has less traction than Mark Zuckerberg. It's it's a very interesting world. And and uh, you know this isn't just a matter of Facebook. So the, those four uh, companies, um, if you put the put their, uh, their net worth together, they're, G, uh, they're larger than the GDP of France. And so they are massive. And w with this influence, um, things are happening, like you know, people are spending more time uh, watching fake news as opposed to real news. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the whole Scott Galloway spiel because I'm not Scott Galloway, but um, I, I highly recommend if, for those who haven't taken a look, uh, to take a look very, very insightful. And so it, there's, there's all these other, you know, um, modern developments like this troll, um, who's also, <laughs> who's also the chairman of the FCC, and you know, he's, he's changing that, uh, trying to say net neutrality isn't uh, a thing. And so these green dots in the contiguous US, uh, these are the areas where there's only one ISP. Um, and if, if there's only one ISP, that means that, you know, you are, you know, this is a utility that where the provider, there's only one. And if so they change their policies, if they you know, decide to block something, if they decide to change your price, um, you have no option but to oblige. There's also uh, PRISM, which is a uh, most wonderful uh, NSA program, where they essentially, if any of your traffic is going through the contiguous US, um, all that data is subject to um, surveillance. So even if you're, you know, if you're a user in Japan and your data just happens to be routed through the US to go to Europe, um, that data can be intercepted and can be uh, uh, opened up. So um, the question of who owns the internet is, is obvious, it's those companies. But um, I would argue that you know, this, this thing that we have um, that is so instrumental to civic society, to democracies, um, we should start taking ownership the way that it was in the 90s. And so the internet has these issues, and I want to say that dApps are here to the rescue. Um, dApp, let me, let me define dApp first off. So uh, dApp is a, an application, a web application. Um, so for example, like Facebook is a web, web application, right? Um, an application run by many users on a decentralized network uh, with trustless protocols. So they're designed to avoid any single point of failure. Let me put that into, into visual terms. So what you see on the right here, the left here, um, is your typical web service. So this is your Reddit, your YouTube, your Facebook, your Twitter. Um, there's one, to, to overly generalize, there's one server um, that serves all of your content. And if that server goes down, then you won't have that uh, service anymore. You won't have access. 
Let me first discuss uh, a decentralized apps. This is a thing that's already hap uh, this is already a, a collection of applications that are uh, existing and they are helping address many of the problems that uh, centralization is causing. So um, I'm going to use the word federated, but um, essentially it means that you know there's uh, an app that is decentralized, that it's hosted across multiple providers. It's kind of like email, right? Um, you have your Gmail, you have your you know out, uh, Hotmail, etc., and they're hosted by different providers, but they you're able to communicate um, with the other providers and the, the users from the other providers. And so it's kind of like a public utility where you're buying from one provider, but it doesn't mean that. Um, it's the one and only provider. Here's one example of a, uh, it's kind of like a Twitter knockoff, um, Mastodon. And you are able to uh, you know, uh, register yourself as a user on one of, their, uh, one of the providers, and then you're able to tweet, and then that will be um, pushed across the entire network of other, um, of other providers. So let's say I was on a provider called Dot Technology, and another one was called Dot Co-op. You'd be able to, um, you know, tweet, and if the other person is following you, they'd be able to see your tweet, even if you're on a different service. Um, Diaspora is a uh, Facebook replacement, and there's there's even a whole network of, of uh, applications. There's this one provider called Thisgroup.org. Um, which helps, uh, wh which provides a whole series of uh, open source and federated applications. Okay. Okay. Um, so these these decentralized apps are very, are very um, have have many merits. So they're kind of familiar, right? It's kind of like email. So the, the the scheme is familiar. It's easy to use. It's easy to get started. The problem here is that it's not entirely distributed. There's only a, a series of, of, of providers, but you're not hosting the content yourself. So the user data is still being hosted on servers. You have to inherently trust the provider. Okay, let's move on to distributed apps. So that's this one. Um, as, as you can visually see, um, this is much more resilient in that if there's any communication uh, loss you know, with a decentralized or a centralized uh, application, there's likely to be more loss as opposed to a distributed um, network. Uh, any any loss is is minim minimized. So th there's a, a distributed app is an app that's run by many users, and all the nodes, all the users or the instances in the system are first class actors. And by that mean I mean that there's no server or client; it's all clients to overly generalize. Okay, this is a little difficult to explain, but it, essentially there is no server. There's all of these, let's, let's um, imagine that this is a, a browser, uh, this is a client, you know, this is just a website you're visiting, and then there's two other people visiting it, and essentially you're running the app in that way. There is no server. So um, there's this, uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain platform called Ethereum that's wildly popular. I personally don't know so much about it, but this is one of the, the uh, larger technologies that are um, in this field. And they have apps like CryptoKitties, which is a collectible website. Yes, um, I really don't know this much about, about this uh, particular field. <laughs> Let's go more into detail of what, what I do know. but. Um, so blockchain dApps, their merits are that, you know, they're trustless. Um, again, I'm not going to go, to go into the details of blockchain, but essentially there's, there's a cryptographic proof that all of the transactions that you do on an application are, are traceable and are, are on a ledger, and everybody is, is able to, to trace that. And so you don't need to inherently provide some sort of uh, trust uh, on a person. It's, it's always available uh, because there's always multiple people running the, the, uh, the blockchain. And there's integrated incentivization, right? Cryptocurrency is money. Um, so let's say you're, you're hosting data, then that inherently means that you're going to be incentivized in one way or another. The problem is that it's not performant for many use cases. Um, I presume, who here has used a blockchain DAP? Oh, wow. Oh, cool. It's a geek room. Um, 
but for many use cases, it's not very performant in terms of the amount of data you can store and in terms of the speed at which you can retrieve uh, information or to provide uh, perform a transaction. And there's a high barrier of entry. Um, other people might argue otherwise, but let's just say I was trying to spend the last two weeks um, trying to get into the Ethereum blockchain, um, trying to get a, a uh, get myself on an exchange, set up a wallet. Um, since I don't have, my, my address is not updated with my bank, and so I have to do that before I'm able to put myself on an exchange. Um, okay, let me talk about IPFS. So IPFS is this new technology that is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed file system. It's mostly for storing data. It's, to simplify, it's a one big file directory. And when you're connected to the IPFS network, you can access the same files. It's just like one big hard drive that everybody shares. It's distributed, so there is no uh, server, in a sense. And it's run by a collection of protocols, which I'll mention later. So that diagram I showed earlier, conventionally you'd have to go to the other side of the, the internet to get that uh, cat. But with IPFS, there is a, a scheme where you have, if you have the same file being hosted by a peer, the nearest peer is where you would retrieve that cat from. Okay, um, let me simplify. So let's say that the data we have here is, is Fox, and something called hashing happens when you are putting information into IPFS. Essentially, it's like a fingerprint where, you know, um, it gives, it gives enough information about what the input was without giving away what the input was. Where, yes, um, if you give the same input, then the hash sum is the same. But if it's slightly different, let's say you add one address, then it completely changes. And what you can do with this is you can make a hash for every single file and folder Okay, it's gonna get a little complicated. <laughs> so, if I can explain, this is a file directory, this is a file directory. You have the exact same file here, right? Um, and this, file directories are kind of like trees, right? There's, there's always a top level, and then they kind of open out, and you know, there's always multiple folders, and then there's files inside, and then there's folders inside, and then there's files inside, and there's folders inside. So it's kind of like a tree, and that's what we call a tree structure. And when you have the exact same file within <coughs> different locations. Um, IPFS has this data structure called a Merkle bag, <laughs> where it's able to converge in this structure um, to, to, uh, to express the, the file structure without having any uh, unnecessary duplicates. Okay. So yeah, that's called a Merkle DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Yep. And this is actually exactly what Git uses. So um, IPFS is actually run by all of these vast, vastly, uh, with this huge collection of protocols. And it's, it's kind of similar in the sense of the internet protocol. It's, it's a collection of protocols. Okay, um, enough of the technical stuff. Let's talk about the cool things you can do with IPFS. There's IPFS.pix. You can upload uh, pictures and then you can just um, display them. You have DTube, which is a replacement for YouTube, where there is no advertisement and then people are incentivized um, to upload and uh, are, are given, um, what do you call it, compensation in cryptocurrency. And all of the files are hosted on IPFS. Um, the Turkish and English Wikipedia are currently hosted on IPFS. Not, not the, uh, the one that you visit every day, but there is a instance of it uh, hosted on IPFS. There's also a chat application called orbit.chat. Um, and yeah, you can do all the chatting things you want to. Um, so currently, IPFS, I, in an in a ideal world, it would be supported by all the uh, web browsers, and then you'd be able to use IPFS directly, but that's currently not the case. You have to run a daemon, and then you have to install a couple of things in order to have your browser um, be actively part of the IPFS network. But this is a work in progress, and already um, there's some support from the Mozilla Foundation, and so we will have it in Firefox, hopefully someday. 
Okay, um, let me just talk about the merits and demerits very quickly. Um, so it's very performant for static data. So you can put in all of your pictures, you can stream video, all these things. Um, it addresses the, the, the efficiency, resilience, and ownership problems that I mentioned earlier. The downsides are that it's still very much a work in progress in terms of um, being able to communicate uh, organically with you know, actual users who have their browsers who are in a Wi-Fi, uh, who are you know, uh, using Wi-Fi in a Wi-Fi router uh, environment. And dynamic data storage, uh, things like streaming something live, is a, it's very, very, very experimental. And there's no supported browsers yet. So um, today I really wanted to show you this demo of this app um, where you can stream music real time and then you're able to play it um, with, uh, on multiple computers at the same time. So it'd be like one, uh, what do you call it? It's like a one ad hoc sound system. But um, unfortunately, I don't have that ready today. Let me give you the reason. Um, so my, the, the technology I used is th these collections of things. And you can see it, they're all very experimental. And then this one particular technology is, has no official releases as of 2017. And even IPFSJS is you know, not a full version. It's still in beta stage. So essentially, I, I built something that's, you know, it's, it's poorly managed technology built on top of experimental technology, built on top of <laughs> experimental technology. Um, yeah, and, and th you know the, these things are updated, and you know um, the the protocols are changed, whatnot, uh, every other week, and it's very very difficult to keep up, and so I couldn't quite keep up, and so that is that is what I meant by <laughs> dank. Um, it, it was damp, hairy, and very. It was there's high you know potential, but it was it was mostly hairy. Yeah, um, but you know for for the interested developers. Um, this is the GitHub for that particular project. Um, if anybody's interested, please come talk to me. Um, in summation, what I wanted to say was that, you know, gentle nerds, we can rebuild the internet. We have the technology. We can make it better than it was before. Better, stronger, faster. Thank you. for just a few very quick questions. Uh, as a particular note, if your question goes over 45 seconds, I have installed an airlock. <laughs> okay. Actually, one minute Lewis, is real safe. Yeah. Airlocks are pretty serious. Hey, Mr. Kondo, I have a question for you. Go ahead. If, uh, if you have this like decentralized uh, thing, say on like a phone, if it can run on something like a mobile device, so it would be limited by the size of the network. Is there a concern, like the size of the amount of data a network takes up? Is there a concern, or is there a way that that's been addressed in uh, decentralized applications? Ah, do you mean to say like the, the your data allowance on a monthly basis? Like, yes. Okay. Well, um, I think that the data allowance would. Hmm. That's a good question. But. <laughs> Okay, hey, let me give you one answer. Um, let's say you're on a Wi-Fi network and you're also, you know, uh, using the mobile network. Essentially, if you're using IPFS, then it would, uh, in, in, a, in a gross sum amount, for the provider, there would be less bandwidth spent if, you know, they started supporting IPFS. Um, it, it's really difficult to run IPFS on a mobile network without uh, some sort of support um, from the service provider. But I think I can see the merit for, you know, mobile service providers also supporting this protocol. because. Yes, it would be much less money spent on much less hardware for them. Okay, um, so can you please repeat the question in case others couldn't hear it? So what is the load factor of each node? And then um, does the node have to store the entire, net, uh, the entire network? Yes. Okay. Um, so the answer is you don't have to store the entire network. Um, it would only just crawl through the, the available network to find pe uh, relevant peers uh, as much as possible. Um, and then it wouldn't start downloading everything. Um, it's kind of like BitTorrent in that you, would, you can only declaratively add files to your node. And then that would start hosting. Is that the last question? Yeah, it Ms. is. Organizer? Yes, it is. Okay. 
So currently there's an incentivization scheme in progress called Filecoin, where if you are hosting an IPFS node and then you have you know, gigabytes or terabytes of data, then you're able to make money off of that, which makes sense, right? Um, and also, yeah, if you want to host your own content, you can do that very easily. And so you have this very resilient um, system and you can just casually host it. That, 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 my friend, is Let's for the break. Later. That is for the break. Subasa, thank you very much for your talk. We will now engage in a very breaky 20 minute break. Uh, we'll see you back here at 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Uh, James, where are you at? Come see me, please. Hi, come see me, talk to me about your stuff. Uh, please return your trash. Trash cans are back in the corner. Bathrooms are behind that. They are unisex slash whatever the current term is. Uh, please get out there and use them. Hygiene yourself.
will want the lights on the stage up still. Like all the lights, like everything that everything that goes on the stage. Do 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 do, 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 do. Places, 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 please. Places for the final act. Take your seats, prepare yourselves for our final talk. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> uh, let me find my place here. There's lots of stuff on this page. All right, so thank you all for sticking around so late this evening on a Friday night. Wait, it's Friday night. You should be here. Uh, we are almost ready. That lens is way too close. There's no way you can focus that close on me. Oh, I don't believe in you. Um, it is magic. Thank you. Uh, so, guys. Um, yes, as you were, uh, could I please have the Nerd Nights Across Japan slide, please? Welcome back. We'd like to share with you a little bit of awesome news. We have had for a little while now, for a little while, we've had um, two sister organizations. Uh, we are part of the Nerd Night Crescendo of Science. I just made that up, it's not true. Um, but we are kind of a crescendo. So Nerd Nights are all around the world. Uh, there are some in great places like Atlanta, in DC, in other places around the world, like Europe, I've heard of as a place. Uh, there are also three in Japan. You are at one of them. There are two more. One is in Okinawa which is very far south. Their Facebook is facebook.com slash nerdnightoki. The text didn't get cut off. It's actually nerdnightoki. Um, can I have you sit down for a second? Like, yeah. Thanks. We will have you join us shortly. Uh, we also have one in Kansai, facebook.com slash nnkansai. They are pretty awesome, and they are in, are they in Kyoto or Osaka? I forget. They are in Osaka, the clearly superior city. Yes, so go see them. I'm not sure when the next events are, but they have Facebooks. You should go check them out. Even if you don't have an account, you can go check them out, I'm pretty sure. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is the part where everybody comes and stands up and um, joins me here on stage. Everybody, all the volunteers, not all of you, I'm very sorry. We don't have that kind of space. All the volunteers come join us, uh, come join me on stage here. Uh, volunteers, bosses, humans, and current speakers this evening. We'll have the rest of you all, the next speakers, the Peter. Section. Yes, the human section. <laughs> yes. Nerd night. Yeah, yeah, guys, uh, scooch up. Tall folks in the back, short folks in the front. So, Selena, you're like way up in front and lion. Um, so, nerd night is put together by a large crew of very enthusiastic and possibly competent humans. Uh, possibly. Uh, from left to right, in the back, Andrew, co-boss. He's pretty awesome. Don't clap, don't clap. We don't have time for that. We ain't got time for that crap. <laughs> Nor do we want your approval. Andrew's pretty awesome. He's a dear friend of mine and works at Yokama Theater Group. He is the boss of it. I've been supporting him for a long time and hope to continue to. Just treat me right, okay? Jesus. Um, no, very close friend. Love him to death. Um, next over here is Kai, fantastic videographer and good friend and awesome hair person. Again, you're not clapping. Very good. Um, fantastic has joined us for a few months now and we hope to keep you around. Uh, Amanda, also co-boss and the, uh, the brains behind the organization. Andrew, of course, is the brawn. Uh, as we're running this for, we've been running this for over two years. We are two years and change into this thing, and uh, it's been a, it's been a ride. Um, Ian is behind the bar and has a beard, uh, and is pretty great. Uh, you're a speaker; you don't count. Um, <laughs> Subasa, he's been here before. He's pretty awesome. Um, Lion is excellent and comes around and does whatever we ask him to do without asking for anything in return. And I haven't bought him a drink yet that I've told him to, and that's a bad thing. Um, back in the back is Don Warren, human. Uh, <laughs> we all know he's human, folks. Anyway, uh, Don's pretty great. He's been around with us for a long time. Former speaker converted into a uh, converted into a volunteer. Been with us for a long time. One of our favorite shots we used to promote Nerd Night is him standing in front of a screen, a red screen at Good Heavens. I eye for images. It's a thing, right? Um, photographers in the room. Uh, Selena is boss, awesome, and has left the cash box somewhere not safe. <laughs> Oh, Yoji has it. What's up? Thank you. Don't worry, I did my job. Uh, Selena is running the front and is excellent as per usual. This is not, not surprising. Have you gotten a photo of her eating vegetables yet? Yeah, got it. Good. <laughs> Check the Facebook. 
Uh, and finally, dear friend Henry Morris has come back from, from his time in the UK. Uh, intern of YTG, pretty boss, pretty great. We like him a lot. His photo isn't up there because we don't like him that much. Um, but he is helping to run sound, and we hope to have him back volunteering for us. This is our group. Mark, do you have enough photos now that I've given you enough time to take them? <laughs> do, should I? Should we all look at the camera right now? Look at, look at the lens. Look at the lens. The same lens. Don't do like the thing where everybody looks at different cameras. Are we doing the pizza? Yes, we're doing something. Yes, all right, sit your ass down. You stay. That was terrible clapping. Try it again. That's far better, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I believe that covers it. Are we ready? Are slides ready for, uh, for James? They can be, it says Don Warren Human. Yeah, I know. It's, we're going to give you a second because I'm going to introduce James here. Um, James, who I recognize from coming a few times ago, thank you for joining us, uh, is talking about boys' love in Japan. We all know that this is why you came. Actually, I thought you all came because you were avoiding bo uh, Bonenkais. Now I know why you're here. <laughs> I should think further in advance. Uh, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Lots of yaoi on screen, full frontal. <laughs> and now I know who's paying attention. And that's, that's actually a bit of a joke, because it's not, actually, that's not what we're here for. Um, we're here for, for something that's actually, or are we? Uh, no, I know, I'm actually very serious. <laughs> that's what I was getting into. Yes, okay, so we are actually very, very serious. Um, Kanagawa University professor and fellow Yokohama resident, James Welker. Yokohama. Yes, great city, we love it, des desperately. <laughs> His trade is gender and sexuality in post-war and contemporary Japan. Among other, among other highlights, uh, he co-edited Boys Love Manga and Beyond, colon, History, Culture, and Community in Japan. I'm getting it right this time, because I messed it up last time. And, uh, and he is now editing a book on the boys love genre in Asia, in Asia overall, I believe. Yes, editing currently. Uh, tonight's talk should shed some light on the sometimes difficult to grasp uh, gender and sexuality norms here in Japan. James, if you're ready, uh, you are holding a microphone. Uh, why don't I just give him this one? I can just give him this one. All right, thank you very much. So let me start by saying that this is um, bad timing for me for a couple of reasons. One is that there is no like little mic thing here and I can't hold a beer. And two, uh, I'm the third person so I couldn't like pre-drink excessively. So here I am at 10 o'clock and I'm not drunk. Um, so um, anyway, so boys love is, do we have any boys love fans? <laughs> yay, yay. All right. Do we have people for whom boys love is not, you've kind of heard of it maybe, but you're not quite sure? Okay, well, I'm going to start basic. So what is boys love? What is boys love or BL? I'm going to probably mostly call it BL, um, and even though I'll talk about the word yaoi that was Anyway, um, so Boys Love is basically uh, narratives uh, that feature male-male romance and sometimes bonking, uh, shagging, whatever, you know, I'm, I, is it, it's after 10, I can use bad words, right? <laughs> Fucking. Um, so it, it, it really depends, but it's somewhere between romance and um, sex. And the thing that may be surprising, if you're not really familiar with it, is that it's primarily written by and for women. And so, yeah, so that's the thing. And so it's been called Shonen Ai, uh, Yaoi Boys Rabu, um, which you might have learned from the South Park episode like two years ago, which was an amazing episode. If you haven't seen it, you really should. Um, and BL. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of that as I move forward. So the thing to know about BL is that it's a huge market. It's a huge industry. This is just per annum in Japan alone. We're talking about 21 to 22 billion yen. So we're talking almost 200 million US dollars. Sorry, I don't know other currencies very well. But anyway, so it's, it's something like that. And the other thing to, to, to bear in mind is that it's like really global. It's this huge, so I, I don't have numbers. There's no way to, to, to um, calculate how large the industry is globally. But, so I've just spent more time on this slide than any other slide in the rest of my presentation. 
Um, and I don't have time to talk about it in detail. But the couple of things to bear in mind is that these different images represent um, all different forms of boys' love. That 200 million US dollars per annum, it's talking about things that are commercially published manga, it's talking about magazines, it's talking about amateur works, it's talking about commercial anime, it's talking about fiction, it's talking about websites, it's talking about the events themselves, cosplay figures, fan art, all of these things all collectively just within Japan and then when you multiply that by all the different countries that you can find it in, it's, it's a huge thing. Um, so then the question is like, how or why did boys love come about? Um, and so if we look at the history in Japan, we have in the early 1960s, is anybody familiar with Mori Ogai, the writer? Like, so Mori Ogai had this daughter named Mori Mari and Mori Mari wrote several novels, novellas, depending on how you define novel or novella. She wrote several of them that are focused on male-male romantic relationships. And some people say that she was doing that to uh, some sort of Freudian thing, some sort of, or I guess it would be Electra thing because some sort of something complex about her father. In any case, so we have female authored fiction um, now, she's writing for a general audience, she's not writing for women, but we have female authored fiction about homosexuality. Um, we also have um, a development in shoujo manga. I should say I could start with this long history of the shoujo manga, trace it back to the, the Meiji period and the concept of the shoujo or the girl and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so I've skipped all that. Um, so we have shoujo manga is basically about girls and romance and all that silly stuff. But then when we start to get toward the end of the 1960s, the shoujo sort of grow up and the, the genre starts growing up. And in magazines that are targeting older readers, well, in this particular magazine, this is in the magazine 17 or 17, um, we have um, a male protagonist appear. And so this is a big kind of revolutionary change. This also has sex and things, but this is targeting older girl readers. This is not actually where shoujo um, like where Shonen and I, like the early BL started. So then we have, um, did I just turn that off? Oh, there we go. Um, so then we have male homosexuality that appeared in shoujo manga in the same magazine. Um, and this is sort of, yeah, I don't, I personally, I don't call this the early BL. This is just sort of part of a precursor. It's part of a different um, development in like kind of female, like, oh, shoujo manga that's ta targeting older readers that's looking at um, sex and sexuality. In this kind of magazine, you'd also see like things like um, pregnancy and abortion and these sorts of issues that were coming up. So how did Shonen I or BL start? So we have shoujo manga, which again, you could sort of trace it back to the early, uh, to the, not to the, to the, to the late Meiji period. Um, but we can basically say in the post-war period, shoujo manga was created primarily by men in the 1950s and 1960s. And then there was this sort of revolutionary thing that happened right around 1970, which is that female artists took over the genre. And so they are, this is sort of like the, the 60s sort of feel to it, but female artists are taking over the genre and they're doing a lot of interesting experimentation. And there are a lot of really important um, artists who are doing this. And a couple of them, we've got um, Takemi Keiko and Hagio Moto, and who, if you love 1970s shoujo manga and you don't know who these people are, you don't actually love 1970s shoujo manga because you don't know who these people are and you're crazy or you're very poorly informed. So we've got these two women here who are like 17, 18 years old at the time. And then there's this friend of theirs who happens to live nearby named Masayama Norie. Now Masayama Norie can't draw, apparently. Um, but she loves shoujo manga. She thinks it's this great medium and she thinks we should do something with it. We, you know, we, we can make this like this great literary genre. So she starts to introduce them to kinds of materials that she thinks should be incorporated. And some of them are things like Herman Hesse's novels, um, like Demian and, um, uh, beneath the wheel, and also certain kinds of films that deal with either homosexual or homoerotic themes. Now, um, so we've got um, this particular, it's Les, Ami uh, Les Amitiés Particulières. It's really hard to look forward, backwards, and move the mic around. I'm really sorry about that. Um, and this actually deals with uh, male homosexuality. Um, and then we have uh, Death in Venice, which also has this kind of homoerotic, very obvious homoerotic plot going on. Um, and these artists put this together and then in 1970 and 1971 they create their own, like, these first works. And one of the things that I want to point out here is this is the very first 
I'm afraid I'm going to shut something up. This is, okay. this is the very, apparently very first kiss in uh, Male Male Kiss in shoujo manga, um, targeting like this audience. And it's immediately followed by a stabbing. Now the guy, he wanted this, um, <laughs> that's kind of like the early plots, right? It's that the guy, he's, the guy's holding a knife. He wants to be stabbed, so he grabs the person he's kissing's hand and stabs himself with a knife. It's not like murder or anything like that. Suicide. Um, lovely. Um, so we go from that to uh, two years later, we have um, Hagiomoto does another work, which is called Toma no Shinzo, or the Heart of Toma. Um, and this is sort of revolutionary. This is what really starts to get attention. Um, and this doesn't actually have sex in it. it there's kissing a little bit, but um, it's really angst-ridden and, and so forth, very literary, very fraught. Um, but two years later, Takemi Keiko, who created that very first, um, the kiss and the, and the stabbing and stuff, and yes, this, it's after 20 volumes, somebody's gonna die. But, um, sorry to ruin it for you, but you should read it anyway, you'll, be, you'll forget. Um, so, this is the opening scene. In a magazine, this is in Shoujo Comic. I should have pointed out that the, the first two works were in Besatsu Shoujo Komi, um, Shoujo Komi. So this sort of like the kind of the off, you know, like the experimental version. This is the mainstream. These are both published in the mainstream Shoujo Comic magazine, and it's literally opening with two guys in bed. And this magazine is targeting 12-year-olds. Um, yeah, whatever. Um, so the question is, why? Why on earth would these young women create this genre that deals with homosexuality Apparently homosexuality, that's a whole other question. But anyway, why would they do this? And the answer is, men suck. <laughs> men are awful. It's patriarchy. Sorry, it's true though, right? <laughs> men are terrible. And you can't have romance. You can't have anything. Because first of all, women aren't supposed to talk about sexuality. Women aren't supposed to think about sexuality. And if we're going to have like a romance story, it's got to follow the 1970s patriarchal model where the guy controls everything. And if you're a young reader, you have to identify with a female character and you're really hampered by, you, you're not free. And so what we do is we get rid of the heterosexuality, we, we make it same sex and there's experimentation with female, female stuff. That's a whole other talk for another time. Um, sorry. Um, so we make it same sex and then the original ones, you might not have noticed, but they were set in Europe. So we're getting rid of like kind of Japanese patriarchy, replacing it with European patriarchy, which seems a lot more free and we've got sort of liberation. And so initially these things are, are liberating girls to think about sex and romance. The nice thing about these stories is if you're a young girl reader, you can identify with either character. You can identify with both characters. You can identify with neither character and just like enjoy looking at these two hot guys kind of kissing or whatever. Or you can do all of that at the same time. It's incredibly liberating. Um, all right, so then the question is what about the amateur stuff that you've probably heard of like, um, uh, like, the, the, like all the fan works and stuff, maybe you've heard of AO3 and all that stuff. Now, where does this come about? Um, so, Comic Market, who's heard of Comic Market? Comique, Comiqueto. Um, so, Comic Market started in 1975, and it was not the first such, um, what's called Dojin Shisoku Baikai, they're often translated as fanzine spot sale event. I hate translation, but anyway, fanzine spot sale event. So it's not the first such one, but it's the one that's the most famous today. Now from the very beginning, it was dominated by female fans. It was organized by men because patriarchy, um, but it was dominated by female fans. And from the very beginning, you've got um, works that are either kind of they're homages to this early genre, this early depiction of homosexuality, or you've got um, the very first BL anime, which was actually shown there, they did an anime version of Hagiomoto's um, Juichi Gatsu no Gymnasium or, or November Gymnasium. So anyway, so basically from the very beginning of Comic Market, we've had this um, there. Now, so how does this, um, oh, I should say, the other thing is, is people talk about like the parody stuff that dates to the 1980s, but actually this is 1976, and this is the fanzine created by the group that started Komike, and here is Uchu Senkan Yamato, um, yeah, and the, it's already starting. So, um, just so you know. Anyway, I don't, it's so hard, I can't even tell, oh, God, I forgot about the rock stars. 
the rock stars. So anyway, so in the very beginning, they're, they're having a lot of fun with rock stars. This queen is almost, you know, it's Freddie Mercury, kind of like it's, it's an homage to that. And yeah, well, you can use your imaginations what's going on there. Um, and here's Robert Plant and Jimmy Page kissing here. Um, I should show you, because we've got the, the David Bowie thing, I should show you. I've got a photo of him in a jock strap, and you kind of do like paper dolls, but I didn't have it on the slides, sorry. Um, so that word yaoi. That word yaoi, where does that come from? So anyway, these, there's groups of primarily young women who are, 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 they have these circles, sakuru, that are creating all sorts of doujinshi, and they're having fun with it. They're playing around with it. And there, were, there was a group um, called, that called themselves Raburi. Yes, lovely. And um, so they called themselves lovely, and they started describing their work as yaoi, yamanashi, ochinashi, iminashi. No, uh, like, it, like a narrative climax, no, in, if it's a joke, it'd be like a punchline. If it's literature, it could be denouement. And then iminashi, no meaning, right? So they abbreviate that as yaoi. Now, initially, this yaoi is not actually about male-male homosexuality. But then this thing happened. And I should note, for any of you who are collectors and geeks, I paid over for Mon for this, but I saw it and I needed it. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so... Anyway, so this yaoi special issue was entirely homosexuality, or entirely male homosexuality. All the stories are all about like male homoeroticism and, and so forth. The other thing I want to point out is, so yaoi, well, it, it slowly over time came to be associated with the amateur scene. In English, when these words sort of transferred over, because the early stuff, some of it is rel relatively tame, that the early, the early works are called Shonen Ai. And because, so be, because it was relatively tame, in, when it came to English, the really tame works came to be called Shonen Ai for some reason. In, 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 in Japanese, that actually means sort of like pederasty or something like that. Um, but the young women borrowed the term and they were using it for their own purposes. But then it sort of fell out of favor in Japanese again, um, except to mean pederasty. So if you look it up in Wikipedia, the first thing that comes up is like ancient Greek and Roman pederasty. And then eventually you get down to a little paragraph that says, oh yeah, there's this genre of, of manga called shonen ai. Um, so yaoi in English and a lot of other languages has come to mean the really sexy stuff. But I want to point out that this very first issue I can't even remember there's a kiss in this. There's no sex in it. There's none, zero. It's really disappointing. Um, so <laughs> what we have today, there's a lot of sex that's going on here. If, has anyone been to Comic Market? Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend you go and you brace your heart, because this is one of three days, one of three halls. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of the scale of it. Um, so how does the amateur scene change things? Now, initially, we've got um, these works that are created to liberate young female readers. Um, but once you start that play, you saw what was going on with the rock stars, right? You know, once you, it just, it opens things up to allow readers to play with sexuality. So first it's like allowing some sort of vicarious experimentation or liberating people in terms of think, or the readers and artists in terms of thinking about romance, but now you can actually play with sexuality. Um, but then this, it's so popular. David Bowie, I had to do a David Bowie slide because of the David Bowie thing. Um, but anyway, it's so popular that it leads to these commercial magazines. And this is the, the one in the middle, June, which later became called June. Um, this is the first of these commercial magazines. Um, and uh, sometimes people will refer to June as a, a specific genre of, of BL because like the art and the narratives are, are slightly different. Um, I don't quite subscribe to that, but that's a whole other story for a whole other time. But what's interesting about these commercial magazines is they're mixing amateur and commercial. There's a lot of fan art that goes in them. Um, and the later works, including this one, Image, which was one of a new wave that happened in the late 1980s and early 1990s, or something like 35 new magazine titles that were released between 89 and uh, 95. Um, these new magazines initially are actually just basically reprinting the fanzines, the doujinshi. Um, what's special about this particular issue, though, is this is the issue. So you might, I'm going to have to look at this. I'm sorry, I'm looking the wrong way. But so you see this little here, this little catch copy. Um, so a lot of magazines have a little catch, or, uh, sorry, that's Japanese, isn't it? Catch copy. Sorry, it's tagline. Um, so catch copy. Um, so they, they have a lot of different taglines on them. And June had something that was using the word shonen eye. And so they wanted to differentiate themselves. And June was also like a, a sort of a brand name or genre name. 
Um, so they wanted to differentiate themselves, so they translated the word shown and I into English boys love, and this is the original use of boys love right here. Um, this is where the word comes from. It actually comes from Japanese into English, into Japanese, into English, um, just so you know. Um, so, um, and today we have like, uh, has anyone been to Ikebukuro? You've heard of Ikebukuro? So there's a, there's a street called um, Otome Road. It runs alongside Sunshine City, and they have a lot of shops that are selling like new commercial works. They're selling voice CDs. They're selling uh, cosplay-related stuff, and they're selling a lot of doujinshi and these sorts of things. I should point out that Cape Books has closed their doujinshi shop, and it caused all this panic, but it didn't shut down Otome Road. It's still there. Yay. Um, so, sorry, I'm running out of, oh my god, <laughs> the, gay, the, the gays. Sorry, I'm allowed to say that because I'm one of them, but um, <laughs> you're not. Um, well, you have some, actually, I know some of you are, but um, that's a whole other story. <laughs> so what does this have to do with gay or bisexual men? Um, the thing is that um, from the beginning, the artists are like, this has nothing to do with male homosexuality. This is just a device that we're using. But the fans didn't know, get, or believe that. And from the very beginning, they're writing into um, for example, Barazoku, which is the first commercial, like mainstream commercial, well, uh, mainstream is probably not the right word, but it's the first commercial magazine um, for gay men, or homo men at, was the ter term that would have been used at the time. So they're writing in from the very beginning, and eventually the editor is uh, Ito Gungaku, he's just like, you know, I need to create a kind of a space for them, so he created this column for them called Yuri, um, or Yurizoku no Heya, so the lily tribe's room, and this is where the word lily comes from, and then reversing that back, then the genre bara, which um, I guess I eventually should talk to you about. The, the word bara gets associated, because of this magazine and, and the history of that, it gets associated with male homosexuality. And eventually, this bara makes, even though oh, we have, it has nothing to do with anything, they're borrowing the terminology from this homo, and I, again, I'm not using it pejoratively, they're borrowing this terminology back into shoujo manga, so that same work that I showed you that started with the sex scene, it's using that terminology, that symbolism. I mean, come on, look, the, the two guys are having sex. Sorry, I did, said there was no sex, there's sex. Um, but it's like a meeting of the roses, and then in this other scene, one of the characters is pointing to another, um, or he's saying something about um, romance with a woman, and the guy points to a rose, and he's like, oh, come on. Um, like, basically, you're gay. Um, so. What do, um, how has the gay community reacted to it? There have been a couple of waves of criticism of this, that it's appropriating um, female, or it's been appropriating gay imagery. Um, and this is just one of them in the early 90s, then another one happened in 2007. But basically, um, but basically, we sort of moved on from that criticism, and we, we can do the Q&A sort of thing. I've already gone into zero. So. Um, What's, oh, did I hit the wrong thing again? I keep hitting a little black button. Um, ah, yeah, <laughs> dirty pictures. So this is what the kind of works are made by and for gay men. This is the earliest one that I've ever seen. This is in um, 1976, this is in Barazoku. And I should point out this Tagame Gengoro, he has then gone on to do some mainstream works. You might be familiar with this. This is sort of like trying to educate um, heterosexual men about like what it's like to be gay um, and the gay community. Um, is BL porn. Um, yeah, there's gay porn in this magazine being sold. Um, if you go online, you can find, you know, you need to be 18 or whatever. I click, of course, yes. And here is Yuri on Ice. Yuri on Ice fans, anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's porn versions of Yuri on Ice. Um, key terms, Shonen I, Yaoi, Boys Love, Junei, we got those, right? Uh, Doujinshi, Comic Market, uh, Seme Uke, we're good with that. Seme is the top, the Uke is the bottom. I could go into that in Q&A. Um, <laughs> Fujoshi. Fujoshi, Rotten Girls, anybody, any Fujoshis in here? I don't want to ask. Um, and Moe. Now, Moe is this thing that, this feeling that you have in reaction to certain scenarios. And um, so Fujoshi became like this big trendy thing in around 2006, 2007, and there was a lot of media products about Fujoshi, and one of them is My Neighbor Yaoi-chan, as opposed to My Neighbor Totoro. And um, so anyway, so when she sees something that excites her, she gets all excited, and um, I'm like out of time. I know I can go for like several minutes over, but I'm gonna play this opening and we can um, the maybe talk over that, but anyway. <laughs> so um, this is just this really, they started to make an anime and then they ended up not having, they ended up not making the anime, so we just have the opening of it. But you can get a sense of like how it's 
like the, the, the overwhelming moe feeling that she um, she experiences when she sees a, uh, in Japanese it's called a kapuringu, right? So in English it's called a ship or a shipping because you ship two people together. In Japanese you couple to them. Um, and so in just a moment, now that we've established this is cute, um, here's her poor boyfriend. Um, and here is her moe. Um, just wait. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so um, this is, they're engaging in moe banashi or moe chats. So they're talking about the things that make them feel moe. Um, and we can see that it's kind of a moe world. Everywhere you go, everybody's seeing couple. And actually, once you learn to see that, you can't really unsee it. Um, you can't. Like, you just start coupling everybody all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a, so, um, all right. That's it. Thank you. Okay, I know you have questions. <laughs> we don't have a ton of time. We're cutting you off at 1035 sharp. So let's get as many questions in as we can in that time. Hi. So I've been listening to this new podcast recently um, called Mormon and the Method, very disturbing. <laughs> um, but one of the things that it posits is that um, people in very religious communities are actually just experiencing a whole lot of sexual frustration, but they don't have any language to describe it. And to what extent does that describe this experience in the, I don't know, Japanese common imagination? Well, I think that the, the patriarchy, the initial impetus for this genre you know what what it's become is a whole other thing but I, the the patriarchy was was something that kind of created the space and if you look at the way that bl has globalized it seems to be creating like really interesting um, ways for young women to deal with gender and sexuality um, in other countries and including like uh, in Indonesia for example where people are sort of like well Islam says that homosexuality is bad but these guys are hot they look hot together I guess this is okay and yeah so it there is definitely something there. Um, so, um, you briefly touched on this, but how could it be like appealing or, as you said, liberating to female audience? Because if you see like two guys kissing or having sex, then, and if you were a girl reading that manga, you're not there. That, so that, this is, is very baffling to me. So the, the, okay. you, you briefly touched on this, but do right. you have um, something to sure, say? Sure, sure. So first of all, I touched nothing, no one, no one saw anything. <laughs> but, but, so if you have a heterosexual couple, like the, the, the way that the relationship works in, like in any culture, there are, are really clear patterns for a rela romantic relationship, for a sexual relationship. And in the, in the case of actual sex, men take the lead. They're supposed to. I mean, yeah, the, we know there's variations. But men are supposed to take the lead, right? And if you have a male-female couple, if they're reading about a male-female couple, the woman, you're conditioned from a very young age to identify with female characters if you grew up female, or if there's no female characters, then of course you're supposed to identify with a boy because, you know, but boys never have to identify with girls because it's patriarchy. Um, but yeah, so it, it's liberating in that way, that it's breaking away from the, if you have the heterosexual romance, there's very strict rules for romance. But even if you look at more recent works with a semi and a new case, so with the top and the bottom, it, there's, even though there's more masculine and a more feminine um, partner, there's still a lot of play. There's still a lot of play. And depending on how you, if you're writing your own stories, if you have, you're coupling two characters from a work, but if you switch in a third character, the person who was the semi might be the uke. And that sort of shows you how flexible gender and sex roles are. So it, in, that, in that way, it's, it, I think it's quite liberating. Okay, we have time for one last question. Please raise your hand so oh, James knows uh, where to look. You kind of touched on what I was about. To, uh, oh, sorry, touching. not yeah. touching. No touching. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you uh, approached, oh yeah. dear, 
Anyway, you approached <laughs> you approached uh, what I was going to ask about because with the case of like Sene and Uke, you have a character that's more dominant, and uh, there seems to be I didn't know a lot about um, BL, but from what I sort of looked up a few few years ago now, um, there's a character that tends to be a little sort of protesting, not really willing. There seems um. to be a, that kind of power dynamic that you also see in sort of heterosexual um, relationships and also a lot of, actually I don't watch a lot of porn, but um, yeah. I'm gathering. So, uh, I'm gathering, say. So. But um, I'm just wondering, in that sense, you talked about it being liberating, but we're seeing these kind of similar dynamics playing out in this fantasy space. And I was wondering why you think that is and how it works. So that's really complicated. So you're basically talking about the rape trope, right? Yeah, okay, there's a sorry. lot of rape. Yeah, the, yeah. There, there is a lot of rape in BL, and usually that leads to love. And it seems to be... <laughs> yeah, I, I it was a bit... It seems to be... It's, it, but the, the thing is... If you look at well, if you look at Tomana Shinzo, which sort it didn't ex didn't have well, I, in fact, actually one of the characters was sexually abused at, at one point in the story, although and that didn't lead to love. This it can be sort of at a distance away for somebody to rethink the sexual trauma that they have experienced. It can also be that you again you can identify with however you want. So it's you can look at this kind of experience in a different way. And if you're, you can identify with a semi and you can be the rapist, right? Which, whether that's good or bad, you know, is, I don't know. But I, I'm not gonna put um, value On that, that bombshell, yeah. <laughs> we have run out of time. They're okay. gonna kick us out of here. You, fine, tell us whether, what was it, rape is good or bad? <laughs> no, I didn't. Please stick around for a little bit. We are going to Yes. This. Um, Bust your own tables, damn it. We're not your mothers. Thank you very much. <laughs> James Roker. Um, do you have a few minutes to stick around for, for other questions? I'm sure you have lots yeah, of yeah, popular... Sure, sure, sure. Yes, so come, come, in, come ask questions. We're going to move tables around you, but please come ask questions. Um, I think we are good to go. You are welcome to... You're dismissed. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This was Nerd Night. It was Nerd Night 28. We love this thing. Come see us again. Uh, I'm, I don't have any... Where am I in my notes? Uh, come see us again next month. We are here again January 11th. Uh, here in Agarito Grid, basement floor probably. Uh, come see us again. The, if you want any more beakers, there are five left. Come grab a beaker, 1,500 yen. They're pretty awesome. I paid for mine, damn it. You should too. Uh, good night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all to the volunteers, to the speakers, the audience, and to Andrew for taking this photo at a very close range. Thank you and good night. Those of you on the stream, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time, January. I forgot the date already. We'll see you next time. Good night.